Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Uh, troopers, and welcome to the third installment of our Starship Troopers 20th Anniversary Celebration, where we go through every Starship Troopers movie and possibly TV show over the course of the four weeks of November. Now, the original Starship Troopers movie came out November 7th, 1997. That's where we started. Right now, we are on Starship Troopers 3 Marauder, aka Jesus Christ Superbug. And if you think that there isn't a musical number in there that is super catchy, you are mistaken, sir. Just before we get into the discussion about Marauder, uh, I wanted to address something that I forgot to mention last time when we were talking about Hero of the Federation that I think is just kind of worth mentioning and, and actually does sort of color that movie a little bit. It, it changed it changed things, well, maybe not dramatically, but the character of Dax, played by Richard Berge, which Dustin and I both profess to like this character very much, he was originally meant to be Clancy Brown's drill instructor Zim from Paul Verhoeven's Starship Troopers. He was actually planning to come back. They had done talks about having Zim come back and then uh, Clancy got the Carnival gig uh, with HBO and was like, sorry guys, I I have to bow out. And I'm actually, I I think I actually prefer Dax over Zim. I think if Zim was in there, you'd have that connective tissue, but it would just feel weird because the movie was so different from the original. They, of course, have that whole thing with the a soldier always has his knife. And that was big in the first one when he's throwing the knife at what's-his-face, not pinning his hand to the wall. (laughs) Jake Busey. (laughs) Jake Busey. And uh, knives are important in Starship Troopers. Always carry your knife, even if the bug could destroy you in hand-to-hand combat. So anyways, I just thought that was... uh, Man, we should have prefaced that with a would you like to know more. (laughs) (laughs) But I thought that was an interesting thing uh, just to kind of throw in. It kind of bugged me after we finished recording as I was editing it together. I was like, damn, I really wanted to talk about the Dax Zim thing and it just didn't happen. But now it's done and I just feel empty inside. As well you should, only because you referred to how it bugged you and puns are terrible. That wasn't even planned. That was... I apologize for Mike's behavior. So let's roll the credits on this movie. Starship Troopers 3 Marauder was directed by Edward Neumeyer. It was produced by David Lancaster. It was written by Neumeyer and starred Casper Van Dien, Jolene Blaylock, Stephen Hogan, Amanda Donahoe, Marnette Patterson, and Boris Kojo. Music was by Klaus Bedelt. The cinematography was by Lorenzo Senator. It was edited by Michael Bateman. Distributed by Stage 6 Films. And it was released July 19th, 2008 in Japan and August 5th, 2008 in the United States. Now, Marauder is, again, another departure we had Hero of the Federation, which was a departure from the original, and now Marauder kind of goes in another direction yet again. What did you think of that direction, Dustin? I think that direction definitely, well, it it sort of pulls away from action like the uh, first one was. It really does, yeah. But it really gets heavy on the satire. It, it's a lot more character-driven and a lot more plot-intensive, and it really develops the Starship Troopers storyline and mythos in a way that I, I really did enjoy. It Though, does get a bit more into, like, the politics and... Oh, especially the behind-the-scenes politics within the Federation military structure. There you have the whole backstabbing things going on for one period of time. You think the general is the bad guy, but then it turns out, no, it was the Sky Marshal, and there was an undercover operation, and this, that, the other. And it was actually very interesting. I enjoyed all that stuff with the the Sky Marsh and all that. Where I found the movie lacking was in the action scenes, which seemed to be almost unnecessary, or at the very least, not super entertaining. It did feel like they kind of played it close to their chest as far as action. And again, I think this film had a budget of maybe a couple million dollars more than the previous movie. So they weren't really working with a lot more and they had kind of a lot more going on. Whereas Tippett Newmeyer had the one set and mostly a cast of what at the time were TV actors. This time around, Johnny Rico is back. Casper Van Dien is back. And he is a parody of himself at this point. Oh, come on. I, I like Johnny in this movie, actually. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
I when I first heard that Rico was coming back, I thought, oh man, they're cashing in, or or the last one did poorly, and now they need to bring back that brand recognition. But I liked where Rico was, the the, the place in his world that he is in Marauder. He basically became his old lieutenant. <laughs> He's Colonel Rico. He. He's walking around, you know, he owns the the language we talked about in the first Starship Troopers when he first took command of the Roughnecks and you know, it sounded like he was just aping the commands and the and the sayings and the, the vernacular of the people that he respected and that were above him and now he's like he's comfortable and he even turns down, you know, that classic turn down the promotion because all I know how to do is kill bugs and that's all I wanna do. Which by the way happens in Roughnecks. <laughs> but I think they pulled back on the action there is the action sequence at the beginning, and there's the action sequence at the end. And there isn't really any major action sequences in between. And I think that was by design. I think when I originally watched this movie back in 2008, that was one of my problems with it, was they were sort of a little more ambitious than the previous movie, but didn't quite hit it. And watching it this time, it felt more measured. It felt more sort of strategically placed. And and narratively, I think it fits as well. So I was much happier watching this this time around. Though the middle does have some pacing issues. Agreed. There's, especially after they crash land on the planet, there's some weirdness in character behaviors. Captain Lola, she... For no reason, up on her ship is getting like zero respect from a lot of these staff members. They're talking about her behind her back, almost openly disrespecting her, and it's kind of odd. And then they get down to the planet, and one of the big things that goes on in this movie is religion is introduced. Before, it was never a thing. Everyone was all Federation, hoo it's all good. Now, you've got protesters who are saying that they want peace. This is the second bug war, presumably things ended and then it started up again and they're blaming the federation for that all these guys off in these distant farming communities you've got an unhappy populace that's starting to turn back to religion and the fascist government is executing them for funsies (laughs) i think this is probably a good place to set that up basically after hero of the federation i think there's an unspecified amount of time maybe five years but the first bug war it it peters out there's no real explanation for it. That's something that they, they didn't explore within the films uh, that I'm aware of yet. Something sparked aggression again, and they attacked uh, some of the outer colonies, uh, some of the uh, civilian colonies, and the people are sick of the war because the war has started again. Obviously, the military can't just go in there. Like, when they went to Klendathu, they were like, we're going to end this in, like, a day. This is going to be, like, the over- this is Granada. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what, seven years later, we're back in war again. <laughs> and so there's discontent. And, and people, you know, the, the Federation, the state was the religion. People had no reason to believe in anything but the state because the state was everything. And now the cracks in the state are being seen. And there is this groundswell, this uh, grassroots movement who are rediscovering God. And that plays into mostly the second half of the film in a really great way and another thing that was set up early on and i called like super fast the entire like everything point by point you could see right away during that first invasion in rokusan you could see rico was all hua fine and dandy his buddy who is in a special ops that would be general Dix. he was super strict everything by the numbers by the book You could tell just by how gung-ho he was on suppressing these farmers who showed any sort of disrespect towards the Federation that he's going to be the character who learns something secret going on high up and starts questioning the Federation. And I called that pretty much right off the huff. You also called the Sky Marshal. (laughs) And I called the Sky Marshal. You've got this Sky Marshal who sings a very good musical number. He's psychic. He's got albums out. He's a cult of personality unto himself. Which they need because of the way the populace is sort of feeling. They need a popular Sky Marshal to rally people behind the war. Absolutely. But when he gets down to the planet, he sort of disappears for a little bit. Then suddenly the walls go down. I call that it was him. He had a quick comment about how the bugs, there's something about them. They're a bit more than just mindless creatures. All right. He's sided with the bugs. I've, I've got this. I see where you're going with this. And that happens later on when they crash land on the planet as I was saying earlier, because one person starts praying and now all of a sudden 
everybody but Captain Lola is suddenly religious. And they were all secretly religious, especially the Sky Marshal. I think the sort of exploration of religion and when you find out what's going on with the Sky Marshal, like when he's standing there and talking about how interesting they are and he's captivated by them, it does call back a bit to Hero of the Federation, which I liked. It was a continuation of that idea, continued developing that. Well, let's just let's just talk about the religion right now. I mean, weaponized religion, which I honestly didn't see it going that direction. But when when Admiral Fid, they've got that brain bug, and she's recognizing how these arachnids are such loyal followers, and they have this hive collective. They know the meaning of sacrifice, and they do exactly what they're told. That wins war. You know, maybe there's <laughs> something to this religion thing. <laughs> and then at the end of the movie. Well, first, okay, it's it's fantastic to have that moment where Holly and Lola are praying. They see the halo of the Marauders coming down, which is symbolic and hilarious and outrageous. And then you have that little FedNet thing at the end where they talk about uh, the Federation wants you to know that... One, God does indeed exist. Two, he is on our side. And three, he wants us to win. Secret four... He's also a citizen. <laughs> <laughs> and just the idea, they, they show uh, now Admiral Fid is the Sky Marshal because Sky Marshal Anoki was consumed. <laughs> After he thought that the massive bug was God, <laughs> which actually was super interesting because the second he declared that that giant bug was God, the other Christians in the group immediately turned on him saying we have to kill the heretic and at that point Lola's like why because he believes something different sort of like how you believe something different from me yeah but he's wrong <laughs> it's 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 the wrong god <laughs> it's the wrong god which is a good commentary on any sort of religious war really <laughs> and basically this war has been winding down as far as support there were peace rallies and and people openly revolting and now everyone is kind of getting behind religion and the federation is now using religion to galvanize everyone's attitudes and hopes and it's just another tool that they're using to control the populace and fight war kind of like the real world <laughs> And hopefully for these people's sake, they don't have as many crusades as we had. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one reason I I regret not seeing more as far as the, uh, the live action films went. Because the animated movies are a little bit more straight action movies. Uh, Neumeier doesn't write the next one. He writes the one after that. So that kind of continues some of the threads. But he lays off the commentary, if I remember correctly, in Traitor of Mars. It spread pretty thick in Marauder. I was really happy to see that because as much as I love Hero of the Federation, because of what it was, because it just owned what it was, it was a weird little horror movie. It was nice to see them get back to the satire and, like you said earlier, developing the inner world of the, the Troopers universe. And even the smaller things like introducing new bugs, like the giant bug that took, what, a sixth of the planet, was it? Behemacoatl. Behemacoatl. So basically a mix of behemoth and... Kuatl. All right. Kuatl like a... Like but, Lipoka. <laughs> yeah, but apparently everybody on set thought the Kuatl sounded a lot like Coital, so they just started calling him Behemoth Coital. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Regardless, it's a silly name. There is a lot of silliness in this movie. I find there's definitely some over-the-top acting, a lot of over-the-top reactions. Most of the stuff that happens outside of the politics... I love the politics. When you get down to the actual planet side, that's where stuff, I feel, falls apart a little bit. I didn't enjoy that near as much as the stuff that was happening behind the scenes. In a weird way, Hero of the Federation went small, and it was all character. Anytime they tried to do something bigger, it felt like they were stretching. Whereas in this one, it was kind of weird, because every time they tried to go small... <laughs> <laughs> They didn't quite hit the nail on the head as much as you would have liked it to. But as soon as they started focusing on kind of the bigger picture in the in the Troopers universe... I would like feel we that the acting was better. I would feel that the action was better. Just everything seemed to work nicer, in my mind. 
I completely agree. I mean, Neumeier essentially co-directed Hero of the Federation. Phil Tippett said in the commentary for that movie that there was like so little time and so much to do that Neumeier took on part of that responsibility. And when it came around to do another Troopers film, Neumeier was kind of in line to direct. And I mean, he's not a great director, but he knows the material. And I thought he told the story as best he could with the budget that he could and the crew and the actors. They shot this in South Africa, I believe. That's possibly why the character bits were maybe a little lacking because that's where you're trying to draw more from the actors and they if you're not a great director either the actor has it or they don't have it if you're a great director you can draw those performances out of your actors and you might be able to recognize what stuff will look like after you've edited and all that and they could have also just been struggling with time it could have just been we have 20 minutes to do this (laughs) you get one take and don't forget your lines Ham it up a bit, because that's how Starship Troopers works. And that was part of my greatest fear with this movie, too, because the promise of this movie was the Marauders, was bringing in, you know, the mobile infantry mech suits. They do bring them in. Like they do come 10, in later. 15 minutes to the words, the end of the movie. They have nothing to do with anything. They're the Deus Ex battle. Machina. They're yeah, basically, they, they come in, they're the cavalry. You know, narratively, it's okay. I think maybe they were hoping that if this sets up like another movie that we'll have more Marauders. But the CG was kind of the best they could do at the time, which wasn't amazing, but it wasn't terrible. The one terrible CG thing, though, at the very beginning, they had a FedNet clip where they shot a bug. That bug looked terrible. I can't believe how bad that bug looked. None of the other bugs looked that bad. Just this one. It looked like something I did on a weekend on a whim. It was just terrible. I did feel that the bugs in this movie generally looked worse than the bugs in Hero of the Federation. I remember at the time I thought maybe that was because Hero of the Federation was using like original digital models or or something, but... I figure it was the lighting. Could have been the lighting. It could have been the fact that this was, you know, had so much more daylight in it. So much more was visible and the bugs were interacting with a lot more well-lit tangible stuff. So yeah, the physics might have felt a little bit lacking. Except for for the uh, kamikaze bugs. Actually, that was something... Hero of the Federation, they had all that smoke and everything was so dark because they basically didn't want you to see anything beyond because they didn't have anything beyond. There was nothing they could put there. And in this movie, they do cheat that a couple of times in a similar way. Like at the beginning, as much as I love the idea of trench war with the bugs... I think those trenches serve both in a production capacity where we just can't afford to build, you know, vistas or sets or, you know, if we just put everybody in these trenches, we're good to go. We can make like essentially two walkways and just keep shooting them in different different ways. Though it was amusing that they set up the movie with a FedNet special talking about how we've got new weapons every day coming out to fight the bugs. Top of the line right now are trenching shovels, which we have nowadays. We've had them for 60 years. Trench warfare was not something that they had really done. Neumeier wanted to sort of harken back to that and to introduce that, he created the scorpion plasma bug. That was the essential analog to the introduction of the machine gun. So in order to get away from these plasma bugs, they had to get underground. So, I mean, that was just, that was promotional. But I mean, you have that and then you see immediately it cuts to a guy, just some random trooper, who's now got to start digging a trench. That's how the movie (laughs) starts, where you start with the here's all the glory and it cuts immediately to you're digging a hole on some bug planet hoping not to blow up (laughs) welcome to world war (laughs) one and while we're talking about weapons the guns i believe this is the merida mark three i loved the guns in the second movie but i was very distracted by the lighting effect that they used to give the illusion of firing because in the original starship troopers there were spent casings flying out there was muzzle flares we didn't have those in two because i think they said the budget for bullets just bullets on starship troopers was like a half a million dollars or a million dollars <laughs> Which they were like, we have better ways to spend that money. So they clearly decided to go back to that with Marauder. And, you know, mad props to them for doing that. Because I loved seeing the muzzle flares and hearing that sound and seeing those casings. But the production designer wanted to go with... There was a version of Marita that they show at the end of the original Starship Troopers. And he's like, I want to take that gun and I want to go big. And those guns were so ridiculous. I mean, did you see the way Jolene Blaylock was holding it? Like, it looked bigger than her torso. It's like Rambo holding up the M4 from the back of a truck, the (laughs) truck-mounted gun, just like, okay, this will do. (laughs) 
So I had kind of mixed feelings there. It was just joyous to kind of hear those Maritas firing again, but they just look so weird doing it. But I mean, it does technically fit with that whole hyperbolic goofball, you know. And to be fair, like even the bullets from that beast aren't going through most of these bugs. You got to hit them in the nerve cluster or nothing's going to work. It seems. Well, it takes a lot longer. And by that time, they've split you in half. And just like we gave a shout out to the music in Hero of the Federation, I wanted to give a shout out to the fact that they're using Klaus Bedelt on this movie. Klaus has done a lot of things and he apparently came in to do this. He was definitely working like under his pay grade. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought he put together a really solid Starship Troopers style score. And whereas Hero of the Federation was going for more of like a Bernard Herrmann kind of classic thriller suspense score, this was more of the straight up action, a little Lawrence of Arabia, you know, walking across the dunes kind of space mystery sort of music and it's really something that throughout the whole franchise so far the music seems to be the most sort of consistently good so i'm just trying to think if there's anything else that we haven't covered that we maybe should i think it's a good time to wrap up i don't i can't think of anything else we haven't mentioned the the naked scene (laughs) i'm always pleased when you have a naked scene with both men and women to see a bit of dong it was shaded sure and they had the very nice joke with uh, the guy taking off his underwear afterwards don't if everyone's getting naked take off your underwear now otherwise they're going to say your dick is small that is the rule it's going to happen It did feel very much like a callback to the original movie. We had nudity in Hero of the Federation, but that was playing more with the horror tropes. And even though it was narratively specific and appropriate, it was conspicuously just female nudity. Although there was the dudes in their underwear that got overtaken by the bugs in that room. And one of them was actually supposed to be naked, but they made them not make them naked for some reason. I like to see equal nudity. I just I just think it's fair. We talk about nudity a lot on this show, man. (laughs) I wasn't going to bring it up. (laughs) It's kind of a a Starship Troopers staple, though. And I actually, I like the fact that because they go into that scanning machine before they go into the Marauders. And Neumeier said that the original idea was when the Marauder comes up in front of Holly and Lola, that, you know, the back would open and Johnny would emerge naked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that would have been awesome. I would have loved that. <laughs> I would have thought that, that that sounded like the best idea because... Especially if he had like a halo to make it sort of a Jesus reference. Exactly, because his his coming to save them was very much done in a, you know, hand of God, angels from on high kind of thing. And then, of course, when he Just reaches his out... dick flapping in the wind. <laughs> when he reaches out to Lola and then she reaches to him, that's totally like Michelangelo's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a little Starship Troopers trivia for you there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think nudity is the last thing that we can really chat about here. So let's move on to summaries. Dustin, do you want to go first? I always want to go first. Rarely, sometimes, maybe never. But the movie itself, as I've said, it really advances the story going on in the Starship Troopers universe, and that I adore. If you are into Starship Troopers and the stuff that's going on, I definitely say it's worth checking out. Don't expect Starship Troopers 1. I think that's the important thing in going to any of these other movies Don't expect the first Starship Troopers, and you can come out enjoying it, knowing that it's going to be cheesy at points and knowing that it's not going to have the same budget. I completely agree. Uh, As I said, when I first saw this movie in 08, I really disliked it, (laughs) and I revisited it a couple times, and I still disliked it. And watching it this time in context with the other two movies and, and being able to sort of see the progression, accepting the movies for being their own sort of entity and different and appreciating what they're trying to do. I'm a lot happier with Marauder. Uh, I I still don't like it quite as much as Hero of the Federation. I made the comparison uh, in the last episode that if Starship Troopers was the Star Wars of the franchise, I felt Hero of the Federation was the Empire Strikes Back of the franchise for being darker and more character oriented and taking everybody to kind of a bleak place. And I thought Marauder might play up to be Return of the Jedi, which I can honestly say I think it did because it rehashed some of the things that you had in the first movie. There was a brain bug. There was Johnny Rico, the hero of Planet P. It introduced a few new things. It increased the scale. The effects weren't as great. (laughs) But it was a nice kind of finish to this first trilogy. While definitely not the superior Starship Troopers film, I would definitely place this as a strong third, although I am expecting Traitor of Mars to knock it out. (laughs) We shall see how that goes, sir. He's dark. 
He's handsome. He's psychic. He's General Omar Anoki. Sky Marshal everyone loves. And gives us strength to go and win this war. And at last night's war rally, he thrilled audiences all across the Federation with a pounding rendition of his latest hit, A Good Day to Die. Fight for what is right. A noble sacrifice. When duty calls, you pay the price. For the Federation, I will give my life. It's a good day to die. When you know the reasons why. Citizens, we fight for what is right. And hey, citizen, now you can celebrate Sky Marshal Anoki and support our war effort at the same time. Because it's always a good day to buy. I will give my life. For the Federation, I will give my life. Would you like to buy more? Um, and before we say goodbye today, we're going to do our shout-outs. Now move to the end of the show. That's right. We've actually, there's been a lot of activity over on the YouTube channel. We've had a lot of subscribers. Once again, to all of you who are joining us, so thrilled. Glad you're checking us out. And uh, you can, of course, find us on iTunes, rate and review if you got the chance, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Libsyn, on WordPress. Follow, like, share, subscribe. Agree, disagree. So to Colton Becker, who quotes the, if it's all the same to you, I wouldn't mind not spending this winter tied to this fucking couch. We are going to spend this winter tied to this couch because <laughs> it is cold outside and there are a lot of movies to watch. We are in Canada. We are in the frozen wastelands of northern Alberta. <laughs> To Nate Dupree, I think it would actually be interesting to see they live mixed with the thing. Which alien would win? What would the aliens do? Would there be a shadow war where they use the humans against each other? <laughs> now I'm imagining Childs and McCready staring at each other at the end of the thing, and Childs going, "Hey, what's the matter, baby?" <laughs> Wait, didn't didn't he have a pair of shades too? At one point, I think he did. Yeah, so he puts on the shades, looks over at Childs. No. <laughs> And we also got a comment from Book Reader. Have we mentioned Book Reader before? I feel like we did. Who feels that this is a dumb podcast? We will agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate negative comments as well. And to Garrett Largy and a little teaser for a future episode. Yes, we will. We will do Close Encounters. Probably look for Close Encounters in December or early in the new year. One of the problems with actually planning out what we're doing in the future is uh, it becomes harder to sh put other stuff in. <laughs> Donaldos Mister uh, comments that in regards to our Let the Right One In, Let Me In episode, uh, we should do a comparison of the Danish movie uh, Not Have Gotten and the American remake Night Watch. I've actually seen Night Watch with Ewan McGregor. Uh, both of them were made by Ole Bornadal. I'd be curious to see the original and perhaps... They're not really horror movies, so they don't fit into that Halloween sort of mold, but who knows? We might do a foreign American comparison again at some point. I certainly don't see any reason why we couldn't. That and I'm be. happy you managed to find us, Kami. Who commented on our Necromantic episode, and also believe we deserve more recognition than we get. We'll get there. I feel like Rodney Dangerfield. I get no respect. <laughs> Ron Jeremy commented on the Thing episode, uh, this movie is a god among kings. You'll get no argument from Dustin or me. You will, however, get us to wonder if that's the actual Ron Jeremy. And thanks, Roni Kessler, for the comment on our podcast. I do think it is great as well. <laughs> we think you're pretty great, too. Aw. And Trolls the King commented on our To Kill a Mockingbird episode. I think this is the first To Kill a Mockingbird comment we've gotten. Enjoyed the analysis. Made some comments about the outro music, which anybody who's been paying attention to our Redux episodes knows. I feel, you know, deep shame with how we were putting episodes together <laughs> a couple of years ago. And I've been going in and uh, tightening them up and bringing them sort of closer to the format for how we're doing episodes now. So I'll probably be getting around to that To Kill a Mockingbird episode in the new year and we'll represent that. And lastly, Rick Mills commented on our Starship Troopers 2 episode from a couple of days ago. And he said that he thought that Phil Tippett's the only person on Earth who actually likes that movie, which I would have to disagree with because we liked that movie. <laughs> so we stand in solidarity with Phil. And, and Ed, also, I'll have you know, my farts smell amazing. Which just flies in the face of me about to say who likes the smell of their farts. So Everyone likes the smell of my farts. And for anyone who has no idea what we're talking about, this is relevant to the comment. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the shoutouts for this week. 
Be sure to check us out on the social media. Talk to us. Let us know what's going on. And you too can have a shout out on a future episode of the show. And we hope to see you next time when we will be looking at Starship Troopers Invasion. The first fully animated Starship Troopers film. But not the last. So thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next week. I've been Dustin. And I've been Mike. Take care. And remember... Come on, you eggs! You want to live forever? A noble sacrifice When duty calls, you pay the price For the Federation, I will give my life When all is fair in love and war That's what my gun is says You're not alive unless you're almost dying These are the words I march by Would you like to know more?